person sitting next to you. <laughs> Anyone? Psychopaths? <laughs> Psychopaths are also pathological liars. <laughs> Still might be the person next to you. It might be you. Um, so, in any case, what you tend to find is if you use scales for moral development, how much, um, how much do these people understand in the moral domain? Psychopaths seem to show, uh, to show profound deficits. That is, they, they seem to understand that their culture has certain rules, and they might get punished if they violate those rules. But they don't really further articulate what's wrong with acting badly. They see moral rules as if they're kind of like conventional violations or etiquette violations. They might get in trouble for doing them, but they don't see what's really bad about them, because they're not associating them with these negative feelings. If you disrupt brain structures associated with emotional learning, like the orbital frontal cortex early in life, you get a similar pattern where people score in, a, in what's called a pre-conventional stage of moral comprehension, which means they see these as, as kind of etiquette norms rather than more important than that. You can even see in adulthood with something called frontotemporal dementia, it's a generation of brain structures associated with, with emotional learning. Um, can lead to a profound deficit in comprehension within the moral domain. So all this suggests that absent our ability to assign emotional significance to events, we see a correlative, uh, or absent that ability, we, we see a correlative failure to understand the moral domain. So one final point to make with respect to the connection between emotion and moral judgment has to do with the role of reasoning. And, and um, uh, for a reason I'll, I'll come back to in a second, I don't want to overstate this case. But the point I want to bring out now is that there are situations where we're very, very firm in our moral views, but not especially good at reasoning about them. Um, so just take something really fundamental like killing is wrong. Well, why? Philosophers have spent a couple thousand years trying to answer that question. It turns out to be really, really difficult. Um, so does the average person who's absolutely convinced that killing is wrong have a reason behind that? a good reason behind that? Or is that principle uh, sort of independent of reasons in, in, in a certain way? Or take another example, so child molestation. What's wrong with molesting a child? Somebody give me an answer. What would be, what comes to mind immediately? Is something bad about molesting a child? You're hurting them. Anything else? Yeah. It might, so there might be long-term effects. You might hurt them. So these kinds of things come readily to mind. Um, if that's what really drove our belief that molestation is wrong, then if we were presented with a case where there was no harm and no long-term effects, maybe we should become tolerant to child molestation. So I gave people the following vignette in a, in a study. Uh, a man is really disturbing to even read, so my apologies if this is offensive or creepy to anyone. But um, a man is dying of cancer, and he only has a few days to live. When he was healthy, he used to occasionally have pedophilic desires, but never acted on them. Now, just before dying, he decides to fondle his eight-month-old niece to see what it's like. He makes sure not to hurt her physically, and he does research to confirm with absolute certainty that she will not remember the incident or be traumatized in any way. He also knows that no one will find out. He fondles his niece, and this brings him pleasure. Was it morally wrong? So how many of you think this is morally wrong? Well, why? <laughs> He's not harmed, you know? She's not going to be traumatized. There's no long-term effects. Now, you might say, I just don't believe the vignette. But I think if I could give you a, a vignette you really did believe, I wouldn't budge you on this issue. When I gave people a scale for how wrong this is, people's average answer was not at the top of the scale. So if you're thinking of a scale of the degree of wrongness, you know, think of seven as the most evil thing you can imagine, um, you know, genocide or something like that. This case is pretty close to sealing. So it, uh, it's not a perfectly designed study. It would be nice to follow up and see whether people can articulate reasons uh, behind their answer. But one explanation of what's going on here is we're so deeply uh, disturbed by this kind of event that our moral radar is saying, no, 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 this is a bad, bad, bad action. Even though our capacity to come up with a reason justification for that intuition uh, may, may lag behind. Um, and I'm, but, Importantly, I'm not trying to suggest that therefore we should give up on our belief that this is wrong. To the contrary, I think the fact that morality is grounded in emotion is just a fundamental fact about the nature of morality. And once we get to a point where we hit rock bottom, uh, where reasons give out, it doesn't mean we should give up on the, on the moral value. I'll we'll come back to that. And another just corrective or, or, or clarification remark. 
I'm not suggesting reason is irrelevant to morality. So you may have some basic values, like child abuse is wrong, but then it takes a tremendous <coughs> amount of reasoning to figure out whether certain things count as child abuse. Um, you might think that injustice is wrong, but it could take reading 10 books to decide whether inheritance tax is wrong. So going from basic values to the application of those in the real world with policy decisions takes a tremendous amount of reasoning, reason and emotion work in concert. But in any case, the upshot with respect to our basic moral values is that they're grounded in emotion. And one way to summarize this point is to say uh, that believing that something is morally bad is a matter of feeling bad about it. And this is a view that David Hume on the screen uh, had advocated back in the 18th century, so we we'll make Hume smile. Um, so, um, I'm just going to check our, when should I stop, by the way? I just need to monitor the time a little bit. Let's see. Uh, Ten afternoons. Okay. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the emotions that are actually involved. So it seems uh, a, a u useful starting place to say thinking something is bad is having a bad feeling about it. But we have a lot of bad feelings. Which ones are crucial for morality? And one of the other ways in which psychology and neuroscience are contributing to our understanding of the moral domain is we're getting increasingly detailed theories of which emotions are involved in morality and what distinctive roles they play. And one of the trends that's emerged from this research is that there's a division of labor. There are different negative emotions that play different roles within the moral domain. Um, so consider uh, a norm that involves uh, the, the protection of individual autonomy. So uh, when somebody violates your rights or takes your stuff or physically harms you, they've violated your autonomy, your individuality as a person. And the question is, what do you feel if I do that to you? So is, suppose I steal your wallet. What emotion do you feel towards me? So, so we tend to get with these autonomy violations some sort of anger. But there are other kinds of moral rules. Not all rules involve violation of autonomy. There is in, uh, in, in non-secular <coughs> societies a whole class of moral rules that have to do with crimes against God. Um, and in, uh, in these societies, they often involve things like what you can wear in a place of worship, how you should sort of uh, uh, conduct your personal life. Within, within secular societies, we preserve these kinds of rules. But we preserve them without the non-secular, without the theological backdrop. But there are things like sexual mores, like who can you sleep with? Like, how many of you think masturbation is morally permissible? Oh. <laughs> how many of you think masturbation is permissible in public? <laughs> Hypocrites. <laughs> um, so take, take another example. So, so some of you think that it may be perfectly permissible to have close relationships with your, your pet, your family pet, your dog or cat. But if those get a little too close, we might cross the boundary. Okay. So now the question is, if I confess to you that I have an especially intimate relationship with my cat, Luffy, <laughs> what do you feel towards me? Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, it turns out, and this is, this is from work by Rich Schwader, there's, there's a further category of moral rules that involve norms that protect the community. So if I destroy public property, so I suppose I, I am a graffiti artist and I cover the local park with my name or something in very large letters, uh, or if you do anything that's disrespectful. So a, a, a vignette that's used in this research very often is they all involve teenagers, so, so kind of <laughs> with due respect to, uh, uh, to Joe. It turns out teenagers tend to violate these norms at a, at, a, at a frequent basis. So something like, I live in New York City, and you very often get on a subway train where a teenage boy is sort of sitting <laughs> kind of like on four different seats, like marking territory or something like that. And sometimes an older person or just somebody who clearly would benefit from a seat gets on the train and that, that teenager doesn't, doesn't give up some of the space. So that's a kind of norm violation. Uh, we can think about this as a crime against community. When a politician violates public trust, bezels funds or lies on the campaign trail, that's a violation against the community as well. Um, can anyone guess what emotion you would feel if there was a crime against community? It's kind of a harder one to... Indignation. Yeah, indignation I think is probably a good label for it. Maybe anger too. But notice, notice this, we talk about anger towards the, towards the corrupt politicians. But we also find that behavior disgusting, 
And I think indignation, or another word for it is contempt, is a feeling that sort of blends those two ideas together. When you can feel contempt for someone, you feel that their behavior is somehow both uh, uh, enraging and disgusting. And here's the expression of contempt. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and make my day look. So. Um, it turns out there are other emotions associated with yourself. So all of us, I'm sure, in this room are wonderful moral saints. So all of us have never done anything wrong. So you're, I'm going to have to ask you to engage in a mat, an imaginative exercise. <laughs> So imagine you did something bad, like like. Um, so imagine you were a, um, a shoplifter. Or let me think of uh, let me, how many of you are shoplifters. Uh, so well, oh, suppose you hurt some. Let's just make you really innocent. You hurt somebody inadvertently. So suppose you you step on your uh, friend's foot very badly, and they end up their you know toenail comes off or something seriously horrible happens. How would you feel about that afterwards? Remorse. Remorse, maybe. Shame. Guilt. 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 Clumsy. Clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> Depends, you know, the friend might, you know, you might have deserved it. Um, so, <laughs> so let, let, me, let me do a poll. So, so you, you, um, you hurt a friend physically. How many of you would feel guilty about it? How many of you would feel ashamed about it? So guilt wins the poll. And that's, that's what you tend to find. This is not really an expression of guilt, but I, I didn't have a better slide. Now suppose you do something different, like you commit a crime, one of these divinity norms. So um, suppose you have a particularly intimate relationship with your cat. <laughs> and you know, suppose somebody finds out. So how do you feel when somebody finds out that you, you are excited by, by uh, domesticated animals? <laughs> Shame. So at this point, shame comes out. This is not shame either, but the thought is again a kind of division. So, um, I want to end with two kinds of objections, and of course, I'm sure other uh, other objections will come up in discussion. But but these are sort of important ones because they've come out in the scientific literature. Um, the first one is really scientific, and the second is philosophical. So there are people in the the cognitive science of morality right now who insist that moral judgments are sometimes driven by emotion, but other times driven by reason. And this is called the dual process model. It's extremely popular in various areas of psychology and neuroscience. It's become extremely popular in the moral domain. So yes, I've shown you all this evidence that some of our moral judgments are based on emotion, but maybe some of them are based on reason too. And the idea is that we have a kind of Jekyll and Hyde brain. So we have this fancy neocortex that does cool reasoning, and then embedded in the brain we have the animalian, sub, the animalian subcortex that leads to these very irrational emotional decisions. And this is the picture that applies to the moral domain. Sometimes you're able to use cool reasoning to decide what's wrong. Sometimes your animal instincts take over and use emotion. Evidence for this comes from things like our friend the trolley case. So, how many people think it would be permissible to toss this guy in front of a speeding trolley in order to save five people who are tied on the track? How many find this permissible? Okay, so, so a few. Um, how many think it's impermissible? Okay, so majority vote here. Um, now consider this case. The trolley is heading towards five people. If you pull a lever, turning it into an alternate track where it kills one instead of the five. How many think this is permissible? Okay, how many think it's impermissible? So, a few Kantian freaks in the audience. <laughs> Outlier. <laughs> um, in statistics, we call you noise. Um, <laughs> so, what you, what you find here is a real switch in intuitions. The defenders of this view, most famously, are <coughs> a, a philosopher turned coach, uh, sorry, a philosopher turned neuroscientist. Um, <laughs> says that what we do in this case is pure reasoning. And what we do in the pushing case is we let our emotions take over and lead us to what he thinks is the wrong answer. And if you look at the brain structures involved in moral response, you do see a great variety, including lots that are involved in emotion. But people like Josh Green are excited by the fact that some of the brain structures that appear during moral judgment are associated with cognition, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the superior temporal sulcus. Um, but Green's claim that we make certain moral judgments without emotion is not supported by his own data. As I said before, every neuroimaging study that looks at what goes on when people make moral judgments shows activation in emotion structures. 
the black bars here correspond to the pushing case, where you push somebody in front of the speeding trolley. 